We are here learning Venomar Amen, Migdash uh, Me'at, how to behave in shul. This is an unfiltered book. Uh, it's explicit. It's not for everybody. Uh, I found this book in uh, one of the libraries here. No name, no author. It's really small. The whole book just gives you sources, teaching you what to do in shul, what not to do, what are the benefits uh, of not talking in shul, what are the things that happen if a person does talk in shul. Um, Let's begin. We're going to continue on. It's, uh, again, a very explicit book. It's not for everyone. Uh, I figured we'd teach it because uh, most people um, maybe have not seen it this, from this point of view. Number 19, page 28. The sainted Rabbi Aharon Roth, the author of Shomen Monim, Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Atahor, and others, writes in his will, It is astounding that everyone reads such frightful warnings and severe punishments, Zohar, Vayedek 285, and Berachot 47a yet do not take them seriously. Is there any greater folly than this? These punishments are hardly mentioned even in reference to the greatest sins, yet rather than experiencing the slight inconvenience of controlling one's mouth, they put themselves and their souls into great danger. Because when one converses during Chazarat Hashas, when the Shemone Yisrael or Amidah is repeated, during the Torah reading or the recitation of Berachot, it is virtually impossible to avoid answering Amen Yatom, or amen with a chataf instead of a kamatz, uh, one without the final nun or, or the like, since he does not know for which beracha is responding. If one claims that he can concentrate, he is exhibiting pure arrogance. Because of him, all our sins are forgiven. Answering, this is number 20, answering amen yeheshem is one of the things that causes all our sins to be forgiven. And it's Haredim, uh, Mitzvah Teshuvah, chapter 7, the end of the book. If a person had an iota of idol worship in him, he is forgiven if he enters Amen Yeheshemeh Rabba with all of his strength. That's the Holy Zohar, Vaikra, and Raya Mehemna, page 20. Number 22. The common people who are ignorant and do not know how to read, learn, or preach, but enter the synagogue or Bet Midrash and respond to men, are rewarded. So if someone simple comes to shul and does nothing, other than sitting down, being silent, and answering Amen, he gets a lot of, a lot of reward from Agadot, Bereshit 79. The obligation for everyone to recite Brachot out loud in order for others to hear and answer Amen. This is something that uh, I wish would be done more. So a lot of times people say Brachot, but we say them quietly. You say Brachot, you mumble it, you say it to yourself, you're at home. But really, the Brachot should be said out loud. Number 23, the Vaveha Amudim states in the end of paragraph 10, Therefore, every Jewish person who hears a Bracha from another Jew is required to respond and answer Amen. This is even if he hears the bracha from a woman or a child. If he hears and does not respond, he deserves death because Amen is the acronym for Ani Moser Nafshi. I give up my life. For every Jew is required to give up his life for responding to Amen. Uh, I don't know if this is halacha um, the a person giving up his life for answering Amen, but that's what he's saying here. Um, every Jew is required to recite brachot in a voice that, that the members of his house or others around them can hear and respond amen. The word amen bears witness to the fact that the bracha is true. So when we're saying amen, we're saying like amen, emit. It's true. So really, if a person's not answering amen, what he's doing is he's saying it's not true. That's where the harshness comes in. Uh, chapter 3. The world and the world to come for those who do not converse during Chazat Hashas Kaddish and answer Amen Yeheshem Eraba properly. Properly. So up until now, he gave us a couple of things that happen if a person doesn't answer or ignores. Now he's going to start to give us some of the goods, some of the rewards and the benefits to answering Amen Amen Yeheshem Eraba. Okay, he may enter any chamber in Gan Eden. Person who enters Amen Yeheshem Eraba, when he goes to Olam Ha'Emet after 120 years, he gets the easy pass. He gets to go to any room that he wants in Gan Eden. And all he has to say is just say, listen, when I was down there, I said, Amen, Yeheshemeh, here's my pass, let me through. And he shows them the badge. They say, you're right, Mehida, you did it. And, you, and they give him the pass. Number one, Hazal say, Shabbat 119, one who answers Amen with all of his strength has the gates to Gan Eden opened for him. It says, "Kol haomer amen bekol kocho putchim lo shari gan Eden." No, the Maharal comments, "The Garden of Eden has many gates, so it seems Gan Eden is not a uh, not just a one path gate, one inside the other." As it as it says that every sadiq righteous person is burned from his friend's canopy, and in Shabbat one fifty two it says that every sadiq has a dwelling place granted to him according to the honor he deserves. 
Shomer Emunim, the beginning of part two, where it explains why one who enters Amen is entitled to go farther into paradise than the greatest Sadiqim. Someone who says Amen has the highest level in Gan Eden. Number two, the Arizal, in the intro to Emek Halakha, intro three, chapter two, told his disciples that during his sleep, the angel Matat would come. Who was Matat? Matat was uh, Hanoch, no? Ve'enenu, in Bereshit. It says when Hanoch disappeared, if you look over there, I think it's Rashi, it says that Hanoch ended up becoming Matat. He became the angel. That later, that angel was the angel that uh, messed up Elisha, Ben Avuya. When he went up, he saw the angel, he said, I thought that was God, I thought God was there, he was the second deity, it was a whole thing. That was, wow, that's Matat. And he, he said he, in his sleep, Matat, this angel would come to the Arizal, would come to him and lead his soul to any yeshiva or palace in heaven they would desire and he would enter and learn there. So too it will be for those who are conscious in answering Amen, that all the palaces will be open for them to allow them to come and learn Torah in the heavenly academy and all gates are open to them and no one may protest. Wow. Anyone who's going to get in the way that when you get to the Olam HaEmet, you tell them I answered Amen, Yehesh Shemir out of the way. He cannot come in your way. That's Shomer Emunim, part 2, page 247. One who has a yard site, a hillula, and davens by the Amud, will not accomplish anything for the souls of his parents if others do not respond properly. Obviously, that makes sense. If a person's going to the Amud and no one's answering Amen, it doesn't even have a minyan. I mean, that's not even a minyan. Number 3, page 31. A well-known story is told from the Or Zarah and Chot Shabbat Siman 50 on the importance of saying Kaddish for a deceased parent. Refer to Darche Moshe and Rama Yore Dea Siman 376. Rabbi Akiva chanced upon a unclosed man as black as charcoal, carrying on his head a load of such weight, usually carried by ten porters, and he was running as fast as a horse. Rabbi Akiva, one time walking, and he sees this guy, old, regular guy, but it was black from charcoal. He's running with a, ten loads on his head, carrying stuff. And you know, Rabbi Akiva sees this, he's super bewildered from this. Rabbi Akiva called him to stop, and he did so. He asked him, why are you performing such hard labor? He's like, who makes you do this? That's not normal. Like, what are you, a slave or something? He says, are you a slave? Are you working for a master who demands this? He goes, if that's the case, I will redeem you. I'll buy you. If you're a slave, let me go to your master. If your master mistreats you with this type of labor, I'll buy you, set you free. Rabbi Akiva was very rich. He said, no problem. I'm not going to allow a person to do this. And this seemingly was a Jewish person, by the way, too. So there were slaves. Jews were slaves at some, at some point. Even after we left Mitzrayim, it happened. If you are, and then he tells them, if you are poor, I will make you wealthy. So he tells the guy two things. If he's a slave, I'll buy you from your master, you go free. If he's poor, I'll give you money and you don't have to do this type of work anymore. What do you need? You need to buy a house? You need to buy, buy I'll give, what do you need? So the guy replies, he says, no, no, no. He says, please, like, don't detain me. Please don't bother me right now. He tells him why. He says, my overseers will become angry with me. Somebody's watching me. And if he sees that I'm talking to you, he's going to get very angry. He asks him, he goes, what is this? He goes, what are you talking about? What, what is your occupation? He said, the man says, that he's a deceased person, he died. He goes, and every day, they send him from the Shamayim down to chop wood, and then they take the wood and they burn the guy in the wood every single day, and then they wake him up the next day, and they do the same thing again for him. So every day he goes, cuts wood, he carries the wood to a furnace, they burn the wood in the furnace, and they throw the guy into the furnace every single day, over and over. So it seems this is not a, a physical, this was a semi spiritual, metaphysical type of situation that Rabbi Akiva was witnessing. He asked him, my son, what was your work in the world where you came, when you, when you came? So Rabbi Akiva tells him, okay, this, he, Rabbi Akiva understood right now that this is, what he's seeing is not normal. It's not a normal person. This is something that has to do with a reward punishment situation. He tells him, what did you, what, what did you do when you used to live here on earth? He says, he replied, he was a tax collector of prominent citizens. He used to go collect the mass, the tax, and he said, I would show favoritism to the rich and kill the poor. So anytime he had to go collect taxes, the rich people, he let them go. The poor people, he did not. He killed them. It could be that he killed them physically or he killed them by taking all their money because he asked him, have you not heard from your overseers whether there is a remedy for you? So Rabbi Akiva tells him, okay, I understand that this is what you did. He goes, but is there any teshuvah? What could we do to fix this up? 
So he says, he answers this man, please do not detain me because they will become angry at me. I have heard them say that there is no remedy. They told him already, he's a DOA, dead on arrival. There's nothing they can do to help him with this tissue bow. However, I heard from them one, th- one thing. He said if they, he overheard them talking, the occupiers, could be it was the Satan, the Malach Mavet who put him in this case. Yeah, Malachi Chabala, they told him if this poor man had a son, and that son would stand up in the congregation and say, Baruch Hashem HaMevorach, and, and then they would answer, Baruch Hashem HaMevorach, and they would respond after him. He says, if he did that, or if he would say, Yid Kadal, and they would reply, Amen, Yehen Shemer, Rabba Mevarach, because they would re- re- immediately release him from his punishment. So when Rabbi Akiva heard him say that, he said, okay. He said, this person, however, was not survived by a son. He had no son. He left his wife pregnant before he died, but he didn't, he didn't know whether she gave birth to a son or not. You never know. He never found out. He passed away. If she bore a son, who will teach him? He didn't have a friend in the world. Nobody liked this guy. This guy used to be a tax collector. Nobody liked him. Rabbi Akiva resolved to go investigate whether the man's wife had given birth to a son in order to teach him Torah and stand up before the congregation. He asked him, what is your name? To the person and his he says answer to him is akiva the person who was carrying the wood getting burned every day was also named akiva he answered he goes what's your wife's name she's he's, the, the guy says shushvina he says what's the name of your city he says ludkia so rabbi akiva now knows the the city he knows the man he knows the wife rabbi akiva felt terrible he felt great anguish and went to that city and made inquiries he was told Anytime he asked anyone, do you know where Akiva and Shushvina used to live in Lutkia? They would respond, may that wicked man's bones be crushed. They would tell him, that person, let him go to Gehinnam. They would curse him. He inquired after the man's wife. And they said, may her memory be obliterated from the world. They cursed the guy, and they cursed his son, and they cursed the wife. They cursed everybody in the city, they told him. He inquired about the son. They told him, yeah. He, a, a son was born. He is uncircumcised, no brit milah. We did not occupy ourselves even to perform the rite of circumcision on him. The people said, we don't even want to do brit milah for this guy. His father was a troublemaker, collecting all the taxes from the poor people and killing them. Rabbi Akiva took the child. He paid to have him a brit milah, circumcised him, or maybe circumcised him himself. And he sat before the boy, this young boy. And he taught him Torah. And, but he noticed that the boy wouldn't observe anything. Every time he tried to teach this boy Torah, the kid couldn't get it. Rabbi Akiva fasted for him 40 days. 40 days Rabbi Akiva fasted for this young boy. And finally, a heavenly voice came forth and said, Rabbi Akiva, go and teach him. After 40 days of praying and fasting, they told him, you can, know, you can go teach him now. He went and taught him Torah. He taught him how to do the Shema, the recitation of Shema. Shimon Esre and Brikat Amazon. So he taught, taught him Shema's de Oraita, Shimon Esre de Oraita Tefillah, Amida, and he had Brikat Amazon de Oraita. He then took him before the congregation and, and the child said, Baruchut Hashem Mevorach, I guess he got an Aliyah. And the congregation replied, Baruch Hashem Mevorach de Olam Ba'ed. And then he said, Yikadal Bikadash Shemir Abba, he said Kaddish for, for the guy's father, for the boy's father. At that moment, the dead man was released from his torments and came to Rabbi Akiva in a dream. He said to him, May it be God's will that you achieve contentment in paradise, for you saved me from the torments of Gehinnam. Rabbi Akiva said, O Lord, your name is forever. O Lord, your remembrance is for all generations. Similar, similarly, my rabbi, Harav Elazar from Vormishta, from Vormisa. Ah, this is Rabbi Elazar from Gedmiza. Yeah, yeah, from Worms. Uh, this is the, the Balat Tosafot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rabbi Azam Regidmiza, he said in the Tana Deve Eliyahu Rabba, it says that a, a katan, a minor who says Yid Gadal saves his father from suffering. And this is it. So that's all we're going to say for today. It's an unbelievable story how saying Baruchut Hashem Mevorach is interesting. Remember, we started today with Hashem Machem and Baruchut Hashem Mevorach, Amonai Machem, and then we went into the learning here and we saw it again. Baruch Adonai Amen. Ve Amen.